So welcome to Cal Day 2015. Uh, everybody should have a great time today. We're so happy that you're here to join us. This is a very special event, and it's kind of hard to summarize my enthusiasm of what we're about to do and share with you. Um, my name is Victoria Robinson. I direct the American Cultures Center at Berkeley. The American Cultures Center hosts the graduation requirement for UC Berkeley students built around race. Every Berkeley student takes at least one American Cultures class before they graduate. It's an opportunity to really engage in what we think of as the best of Berkeley, work that creates social change, that centers the transformation for the next generation built around equity. And the partnership that we're about to um, share with you today does everything and more that I think Berkeley could hope for and expect of our faculty, our community, and our students. Um, the ACES program, the American Cultures Engaged Scholarship Program, was the hosting initiative for the partnership. And I have to just have a quick shout out to the Haas Junior Fund, which um, is a local organization, local foundation, that provided generous funds to allow this to happen, particularly Bob Haas, who's a great friend of Cal. There's lots of people who've made this partnership possible, and that the, some of the most important members of that partnership are here. And without further ado, just please welcome um, this great set of panelists who will explain the partnership and why we hope that in coming to Berkeley, you will seek more of these kind of partnerships and find them as part of the Berkeley DNA. So thank you. Welcome. Let's introduce our panelists. Hello, can you, yes, am I appropriately loud? Yes, okay, oh, um, actually I think I have this. Is this working? Is okay? okay. Um, my name is Jane Stanley and I direct the college writing programs. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce this, this amazing group of people. But first, let me get a sense, um, and I think we've got lots of, no, are they gone? Do we have folks up here? How many people are um, already, you know, current Berkeley students here in the group? Ah, only a few. And prospective students? Okay, interesting. All right, all right. Well, welcome everybody to Cal Day. And um, I have to say, I love Cal Day because it's, it's an opportunity for uh, the university to showcase such awesome talent. And um, today is my opportunity to, to introduce some awesome talent right here in <laughs> front of you. Um, I have thought a lot about these people, and um, I've prepared a, a couple of remarks, and I hope you will forgive me um, for reading them to you. They are not the less heartfelt for being read. It's just that the memory isn't what it used to be. <laughs> so. Um, these, these people have come today to talk to you about an amazing piece of scholarly work that they're all engaged in. Um, this is historical, cultural, and environmental scholarship. And all of this is coming to light thanks to a Berkeley course. So um, the course is called Researching Water in the West. And what could be more appropriate in this year number four of our drought? Um, the course, Researching Water in the West, was the brainchild of Pat Steenland. Um, she's been on our faculty at the college writing programs for about 14 years. Um, we stole her from Harvard. Um, <laughs> she, she created Researching Water in the West as a way for students to develop their ability to do primary research. Not so much to be writing about other people's research, but to be making their own discoveries. Um, and Pat chose Water in the West as the course theme because, as, as you all know, California has a complicated history of water wars in, in her quest for expansion. Um, and because the water war story is um, so central to the American story, Pat's class became affiliated with the American Cultures Center, as Victoria told you. Um, in fact, recently, Pat was honored by the University and American Cultures Engaged Scholarship Center um, as a Chancellor Scholar for Community-Based Research. This is um, 
an uncommon honor, and we're very proud. Um, Pat's partner all along the way has been Teresa Salazar. Teresa, forgive the point, over there at the very end. Teresa is a librarian um, who has the awesome responsibility of curating the university's huge and, and hugely valuable archival collection of collections of Western Americana. Um, these archives are de designed to document nothing less, I have to quote here, nothing less than the history of human activity in America west of the Rockies. Uh, <laughs> quite, quite the job Teresa has. Um, her archives have been credited with allowing, an, another quote, an unparalleled opportunity to explore the social, political, cultural, and environmental development of the West. Under Teresa's curatorship, the collections have expanded, and more scholars, students, and community members have been invited in. Um, you, know, you know that you can Google someone to see if other scholars have credited them for contributing to their work? Well, I Googled Teresa, and you will, I, I was astounded um, <laughs> to find that 150, 150 some, writers and, yeah, writers and historians had credited her for helping them discover the treasures that the archives hold. And one historian uh, put it this way in an interview, and again, I'm going to quote, um, Teresa Salazar's wide knowledge of the archives' contents and potential for changing knowledge about California completely changed my own professional life. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and now it's time to bring Harry Williams into the story. Uh, Harry is an elder of the Paiute tribe, and particularly the Owens Valley Paiute. Um, he taught me that the root of the word Paiute is Pai, which means water, um, and that's highly appropriate to our story today because if California has a complicated history of water wars, the Paiute of the Owens Valley have an equally e even more complicated relationship to the water wars and California's quest for expansion, particularly in Southern California. Um, Harry is an, un, an outspoken member of the tribe. Uh, he's an environmental activist, and most particularly, he is a water activist. Um, he has close knowledge of the historical appropriation of water resources from the Owens Valley Paiute, and he has close experience of the ongoing water politics in the region. Um, additionally, and, and I think critically, Harry has knowledge from his elders about the traditional methods of water stewardship that once made the now dry Owens Valley bloom for thousands of years, yes? Yeah. Um, Pat learned about Harry's activism and his deep knowledge, and she asked him to speak to the class um, in its inaugural year. Um, he did, and thus began Harry's collaboration with Pat and Teresa, and the students, and with Berkeley generally. Last year, Harry was awarded the title of Berkeley American Cultures Community Scholar. Um, quite an honor and quite well deserved. Um, and finally, we come to Jenna Cavell in the red and black over there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, she is also a water activist who has researched issues of access to clean water and, and water injustice in places like Indonesia. She has also worked tirelessly to publicize the environmental downsides of desalination as a solution to our own drought. Um, Jenna transferred to Berkeley in 2010, I'm thinking, yeah? I think so, yeah? In 2010, and naturally, as a water activist, she enrolled in Pat's class. She began working with Harry on a project in the Owens Valley, which you will hear more about very shortly. 
Um, and she was recognized by Berkeley for her work and was awarded the prestigious Stronach Prize. Um, that prize funded her to live in the Owens Valley as a visiting researcher for about a year. One year turned into three. Three, okay, <laughs> one year turned into three, working with, working with Harry and with other members of the Paiute community, and they will be talking about that. Um, from that collaboration came the idea for a documentary film on Paiute water stewardship. Um, and I have to tell you, the film idea has grown into something quite wonderful, as you'll see. Um, Jenna, after she graduated, well, even before she graduated from Berkeley, was pursued hotly by the University of Southern California to do graduate work in their justly famous film program. Um, her ongoing work on this documentary was recognized and she was awarded an Annenberg Fellowship, not, not too shabby, Jenny. <laughs> and um, it's been, this is her second year as an Annenberg Fellow, so this is an enormous accomplishment. Um, Jenna is halfway through her graduate program and not surprisingly for someone with Jenna's passion and energy, she also serves as a member of the USC Institute for Social Justice. Um, so that's everybody. That's, that's the folks you see assembled before you. Um, there's your introduction, and now I'll give it over to Pat. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to everybody who came today. And we're really excited about this work and eager to share it with you and also eager to hear your reactions. I think we're all going to speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, Jenna will show a clip from her film, and then we'll just open it up after that. And, like Jane, I apologize for reading, but I was a little bit worried about my memory. Uh, I do want to thank Jane uh, right off the bat, not just for moderating, but for her complete support of this class from its creation all the way through. And this class would never have come to be if it weren't for Jane. So thank you, Jane. And also to Victoria, who's been a very, very faithful supporter of this class. And also people who really worked to put this event on, um, Elizabeth Dupuy of the library, uh, Susan Akeen of uh, Public Service Center, and especially Doug Parada of American Cultures. So thank you to all of you. OK, as Jane mentioned, um, uh, you know, I created a class uh, focused on pri primary source research. Uh, I've been working with Teresa for years uh, in other classes about that. So this class was different, so I'm just going to start talking about this new class. As Jane mentioned, the theme was water. And it was not meant to be a comprehensive study of water in California, which would be impossible. Uh, instead, we focused on uh, what we called water stories. And um, one of those, we chose two. And uh, the one we're focusing on today was the story of the Owens Valley. So as is well known, the city of Los Angeles acquired the Owens River through questionable means in order to meet its soon to be desperate water needs. Chief Engineer William Mulholland built the LA Aqueduct, which to this day delivers water to the city from the valley. And also to this day, LA Department of Water and Power owns most of the valley. The most familiar telling of his story is the great Hollywood classic film, Chinatown. And we're probably familiar with the basic plot, which is that the corrupt and decadent city leaders of Los Angeles, represented by the villain Noah Cross, steal the water from unsuspecting landowners in order to create the sprawling city that we know today. It's a really great film noir tale. And its hugely influential telling has to be part of any study of the subject. And even if you believe the film is a distortion, which many people do, it still has had such a lasting impact that a recent front page story in the New York Times on the Owens Valley used the film name in the header. But in the class, we were interested in going beyond, so what could we find beyond Chinatown? So in order to examine as many perspectives as possible, we looked at many different materials from different disciplines. As an American cultures class, we were especially interested to track the different populations whose lives had intersected because of this water story. So apart 
from the ranchers and farmers whose water had been taken, for example, they were also, during World War II, Japanese Americans who were interned in Manzanar, the desert prison camp hastily built in the Owens Valley. It is now a national park site. So this part of the story might usually be studied in an American history class or an ethnic studies class. But looking at Manzanar in the context of this water story, for example, highlighted ironies that might otherwise have gone unnoticed. It's widely known that the federal government had to hunt for remote places for the sites of these camps since anti-Japanese feeling ran so high. No governor wanted a camp in his state. And Manzanar was one of the places chosen for its barrenness and remoteness. But it had been made that way fairly recently by the LA Aqueduct. The name Manzanar means apple orchard in Spanish, and that was indeed what had been flourishing there before LA took the water. Not only that, many of the re residents of Manzanar came from LA. The earliest internees drove themselves there across the Mojave in a long car caravan. Before they left, they had been law-abiding Los Angeles residents who no doubt had been paying their water bills regularly to the Department of Water and Power for the water that was now visibly flowing away from them in a place that had been rendered a desert by the absence of that very water. So our class was finding that this water story was proving to be a connecting thread across time, across cultures, and across academic disciplines. But I ran into a curious roadblock. It was well known that the Paiute were the first to dwell in the Owens Valley. They still live in the valley. What was their part in this story? I was looking for something from their perspective, since it was important to me throughout to find materials that represented firsthand the views of the people we were studying, not what had been said about them. And I could not find such a source. The Paiute were much studied by UC Berkeley anthropologists during the 20s and 30s, in particular by anthropologist Julian Stewart, who had written a well-known ethnography and had collected traditional Paiute tales. But that seemed to be it. Where was I going to find something closer to the voice of the Paiute people themselves? I asked people on campus. I called around. Finally, I was given a phone number. And on a beautiful fall day four years ago, as I walked through Rock Ridge on my way to the BART station, I called that number. And hundreds of miles away, Harry Williams answered the phone. And I don't think either of us had any idea what would result. It turned out there was a riveting part of the story that had never made it into the accepted narrative. First, if you have never seen it, the Owens Valley is a place of spectacular beauty. It is a narrow valley, 6 to 20 miles wide, and approximately 100 miles long at 4,000 foot elevation. On its western side, one of the most beautiful parts of the High Sierra, John Muir's beloved Range of Light, forms a sheer wall with 14,000 foot peaks dropping 10,000 feet straight down to the valley floor. To the east, the White Mountain Range forms a similar natural barrier. For the hundreds of years, no doubt longer, that the Paiute had lived in the valley, they had transformed it into a remarkable and beautiful habitat. Over the course of time and before white contact, they had learned to engineer the water that came down in creeks from the Sierras into carefully constructed channels designed to flow at a specific gradient. The canals were allowed to come to an end and drain into the land before reaching the river, thus over time raising the level of the water table. The tribe periodically elected a head irrigator who decided when to open the canals for water flow and where to channel it. <clears throat> Plant species were selected and harvested. The valley, the valley bloomed. This blossoming landscape is what drew white settlers to the valley. They took the land and the water from the Paiute, claiming the ancient canals for their land and cattle. A thriving communal practice became private property. A people was dispossessed. When the Paiute offered resistance, the army came in. The Paiute were attacked, hunted, 
and eventually taken from their home and marched off to Fort Jahan. This cultural legacy was broken. The history of this achievement became obscured and largely forgotten. In time, the movie Chinatown became the best known story about the Owens Valley, a narrative in which the Paiute are non-existent. For years, Harry had been walking the valley, tracing this ancient system. He also read up on every available piece of scholarship and attached himself to every archeological dig that came into the valley. A few scholars had noted the existence of these canals, but only a very few. And somehow their scholarship, which is, by the way, very admirable, didn't seem to register in the larger scheme of things. <clears throat> For example, even a recent treatment, Mark Reisner's Cadillac Desert, gives just a sentence or two to this topic, stating that the Paiute had irrigation, but that they had learned it from the Spanish, an assertion that is entirely inaccurate. You will hear more about this story from Harry and also from Jenna, who was a student in class the very first semester I taught it. But before that, just a couple words about the role of the university. Harry's presence in my class as a community scholar not only presented new material to the students, he sparked their imaginations. Who was the genius who had thought of the system? What did it take to create it? What must the valley have looked like in those days? And finally, why was this story not better known? As Harry became more involved, it soon became apparent that holdings in the Bancroft collections were directly related to Paiute history and culture. The Bancroft holds evidence that helps support Harry's narrative of his people's achievement. It is known that a 19th century surveyor, A.W. von Schmidt, had drawn maps of this ancient irrigation system when he had been sent on an expedition to chart the California-Nevada border. These drawings are invaluable evidence documenting the complex Paiute system as it existed before white contact. But von Schmidt's notebooks proved notoriously difficult to trace. Thanks to Den Jenna's diligent efforts that first semester, the crucial notebook was actually found to be in the possession of the Bancroft. Other value materials are there. I would like, whilst at this point, to single out one remarkable collection that is now the focus of our class research. It is a group of Paiute oral histories taken down in the 1930s, found in the ethnological documents of the Department of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. Drawing upon available WPA funds, two young anthropologists from Cal traveled to the Owens Valley at the height of the Great Depression to conduct oral histories. Some of their participants were 80, 90 years old. They thus would have been small children at the time of white contact. The collection is a treasure trove of traditional tales, personal histories, information about plants, and water stories. They were recorded in simple blue books, now fragile with, fragile with age. They have never been published. They represent an astonishing collection of traditional materials and knowledge, much of it lost to the tribe. I think their cultural importance cannot be overstated. In class, we now hope to continue our research partnership with people from the Paiute community, some of whom are actually the descendants of the original storytellers to restore the connection. It is a thrilling and meaningful project. I hope it is abundantly clear that a key part here is the Bancroft Library and curator, Teresa Salazar. I tell my students that history as we know it is written by historians but that the vast and unknown country called the past contains things that often don't make it into the historical record. Sometimes, if we are fortunate, incredible parts of the past can be found in our research libraries, waiting quietly for a new generation. In this respect, we are so fortunate to have Teresa as our partner, who instead of taking the role of gatekeeper, who allows only illustrious scholars to enter, and there have been many, and you heard from Jane how many of them rely on Teresa, Teresa also opens the door to the archives to discovery and illumination for students, community members, and other members of the public. And that is the kind of exciting thing that can happen here at Cal. In addition, the classroom is a place where we can meet to discuss, disagree, reassess, and connect. This rediscovered story is not only exciting, it also contains pain. Dispossession and violence are part of it. Also, the university's role bears examining. 
To this day, the university holds over 10,000 Native American remains. They have not been given a ritual burial. Instead, they are housed as academic artifacts under Hearst Pool, witnesses to a brutal time when anthropologists harvested Native American burial grounds for their research. While some of these human remains have been repatriated under the NAGPRA Act, many are still there. Among them are Paiute bodies. In fact, Harry's first visit to campus, long before I ever called him on that day in Rockridge, was to visit this site to perform a ritual for the bodies of his people. This painful part cannot be excluded from the story, but it can be explored in an honest partnership if we are willing to listen. I was trying to think of an apt metaphor for this process, and it came to me that no better one exists than the university motto, fiat lux, let there be light, taken from the biblical story of creation. I wondered about the grammatical mood of the verb. Is it a command, a declaration? And no doubt if there's a Latin scholar here, they will correct me, but the closest I could come this grammatical category called the desiderative subjunctive, subjunctive, which is when you express a desire that something may exist. Fiat Lux expresses the desire for light to come into being, let there be light. It also implies that the effort to bring about light is the mission of the university. I think in this partnership, what unites us is the collective commitment to the effort to shed light. Light is democratic. You don't know what it may reveal. But you commit to the belief that working towards shedding light is better than allowing the darkness to remain. In this partnership, we work together to shed light on a part of California history that has been in the shadows for far too long. And before we go next, I just want to say, give a little shout out to the students who are currently taking the class. If they could just stand up. If anybody has questions afterwards, the, you know, the research continues. This is a phenomenal group. They're doing really great work. So CW 50, 150 guys, stand up, OK? <laughs> OK, so now I'm going to turn it over to Harry. Uh, I think better on my feet, so I'm going to stand up. I don't know. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thankful, and I'm grateful for this team I look at with me and uh, Cal Berkeley. I didn't know I'd be on this trail, this path, but when I was a little kid, I got, uh, I was at a parade and I made fun of this float. It was a Native American float with tulis hanging on it. And this girl just come up and said, that's your people, don't make fun of them. You be proud of them. And from that point on in my life, I was. I just said, okay, that's it. But as I grew up, my grandparents and my parents were part of the Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding systems where they never were taught any of our history. I used to ask my grandmother when I was a little kid, uh, could you teach us any Indian words? Could you teach us some language? She, she just said, she just looked at me like, no. She had it beaten out of her. So throughout my life, I was always having to protect who I was. I grew up poor. I didn't know I was poor. It didn't bother me that I was poor. I enjoyed life. I, I just, uh, I was a good athlete. I, later on in life, I found out my father and my family were from really good blood. I had some elders tell me that you're from good blood, they told me. And uh, so it really started for me throughout my life. I was always trying to learn as much as I could about my history, my people's history. And then around 1996, I, uh, I was driving from, uh, I was on an intertribal council of California uh, board and I was coming back from San Bernardino and as I approached Lone Pine, where the one's dry lake is, all this dust was blowing off. And I'm standing, I'm driving towards it, like, oh man, how those people, how do they live like that? And my first thought was, as I get into town, I start tasting this metallic taste in my, my mouth. And I, I, I told myself, how do these guys live like that? And then I, one second later, I went, the wind's blowing towards my house. I live 60 miles away. And I just had a, a child, Noah, and I went, now this is my problem. I, then I joined the Owens Valley Committee because they were the only uh, people fighting back against LA, their water extraction. So I joined them and they had been in existence after the second aqueduct 
had been made to take more water out of LA, to take water to LA and from out of the valley. But then when the movie Chinatown came out, one of the things that really doesn't say is there was a false drought. What they were doing, and they portray in the movie Chinatown, they were dumping water out of the reservoirs to make a water shortage, and then they were able to get their bond money to fund the second aqueduct. Well, I grew up in that age, and everybody was happy to work on the aqueduct because there wasn't very much work in the area. But right off, LA started pumping to fill that second aqueduct. And I had grown up playing in tulies in places that were wet and hunting rabbits in places where the sagebrush were big. Today, there's no more sage places. A lot of it's just dry. And so when this drought came along, I looked at it as, we had a man-made drought that was made by LA because they dropped our water table, which my people had lifted up. And I never realized what I did, but when I first heard about these uh, ancient irrigation ditches, and this one lady showed me one of them, I looked at it as, oh, that's my history. So every chance I got, I walked them. I found out where one was, I walked it. It took me a long time, it took me three times to walk it. It's about three or four miles long. But it went in every little ravine. There was not like the straight, so like I have a garden over there, I wanna run my water straight to it. These things went in every little gully and after a while of walking so many and driving around, just looking around, I started noticing more and more. And then I started looking for every report I could find because we had an Owens Valley Indian Water Commission that uh, was documenting our fight for more land and more water rights. Because in the 1860s, we didn't understand. Or, you gotta realize, the first white person we'd ever seen was in 1856, and that was Von Smith. He was a surveyor for the state of California doing the border. And in our area, he did uh, townships, five mile squares. But when he came in from the south of the valley, and he started, every time it hit one of his transects, that he would mark it. And then after a while, he got so far into the valley, he just started calling them Indian ditches because he realized these were man-made. They weren't just natural. And people would say, when I'd ask certain people, very educated people, go, well, they just followed it downhill. I said, what about the ones that went sideways? And they would go like, what? They didn't realize what I was finding. And then the more and more I found, I, I, I'd just walk them. I'd just look for them. That, that became my hobby. Uh, as I got older, I realized, you know, you've got to walk around, use it or lose it. So that's what I did. I just started <laughs> following them every day. And then every time I'd run into new ones. And then I, I started hearing about Von Smith's uh, reports. And I started finding them and finding other stuff uh, where they were. And every time I'd go places, I'd find them. And I'd be like, oh man, I gotta walk this one too. And throughout the valley, for every creek from Lone Pine to Sherwin Grade, every creek had an ancient irrigation ditch. And when I started finding out this information, I was like, whoa. I started looking at him and looking at him and realizing. Then I got to the point of realizing how I, am I identifying these things? Then I started realizing, uh, the more reports I read, that there was only two types of trees in our valley. Uh, the cottonwood and the black willow. We were such a remote area, we were isolated, that we couldn't have seeds blow over the mountains. Then we had the Mojave Desert, then we had the Great Basin on the other side. So we were very limited. And then I'd read and read and find out more about the stuff. And I, I grew up uh, as a counselor at what's called a Paiute Mountain School, and I was very lucky. Uh, by the time I was 18, I was the director of this Paiute Mountain School. We'd take for four weeks in the summer, we'd take kids up in the mountains, and I became very comfortable, but I also realized I needed to learn some of my cultural heritage, how to make traps, how to identify stuff, what food we made, because I needed to teach them to these younger kids. So I started studying, I started reading books. I read this one book called The Ancient Survival Arts of the uh, Great Basin Paiutes, and, uh, then I realized that one lady that they really discovered or talked about or studied her was Woozy George from Schurz. And that was my great grandmother's half sister. And so I felt proud about that. I said, all right. And the, but also when I went to the mountain schools, I ran it in such a way that these old elder ladies, they all wanted to come up and they liked the way I ran it. Because I was just like simple. This is just living up in the mountains. We had food and 
explore the mountains and let the kids eat fresh food. Well, when we did this, I had to teach them, and I had six old ladies, all elders. One was born in 1900, Helen McGee, Ruth Brown, her daughter. These old ladies, they liked me. And then one day, as we were four-wheeling it up there, Ruth told me, because she goes, maybe you be the one. I looked there, said, the one what? Maybe I'd be the one. She goes, the one that will fight for the plants and animals. And I kind of went, what? So I kept on driving. But today, I guess that's what I'm doing. She could see it before I could see it. She seen my path. And as life went on, and then I joined Owens Valley Committee, I started fighting for our valley because the water extraction that LA was taking was killing our valley. They were turning it in into a desert. They were doing desertification. So when this drought hit, I was just kind of like, you guys, we've been faced with this already. You have decimated, turned our valley. And they would always turn around and say, oh, well, we have so many people down there. You got to care about them. And after a point, I go and say, no, I don't. I said, you don't care about us, so why should I care about you? You have let this animal get so big, and we keep having to satisfy this animal. It keeps getting bigger. One of their comments was always, oh, well, we have all these many people down here. And I go, well, you know, that's so. You know, you got to get water. But then they would go, well, you got to feel sorry for us. I, I, I'd say, no, I don't. You guys don't feel sorry for us. You're killing our valley. You're killing my homeland. And so what I started thinking was, and this one guy said, well, you know, we've used the same amount of water for, for about 20, 30 years, and we've added a million more people. Then I was like, how do I argue against that? I said, well, that's how extravagant you've been with this water. You could probably add a couple more million, and it won't bother you because you live like you're in Beverly Hills. You got this. It's a desert LA, but they treat it like a garden, a Garden of Eden. But we, they destroyed my Garden of Eden. Our valley, because of the ancient irrigation systems, created a paradise. They made the sideways ditches so flat, they, they didn't expect the water. They didn't want the water to go to the end. But it got, got, went to the end, it basically soaked into the ground. And so the groundwater table came up. And that was the main reason why LA came up there. Because when I started discovering and looking for ditches, I, I realized there was three entities that helped this valley as humans. There was the tribes, there was the ranchers, and in 50 years, ranchers that came in, took all the land, and displaced us. But they also hired the tribes as their workers. They were the ones that saved us because basically the uh, federal government wanted just to relocate us, take us down to Fort Tejon, just say, this is ours, we're taking it. Well, the ranchers kind of saved us. But then DWP, came in and bought everything up. And they very I was evil, evil spirited, but they didn't mean to. They were just looking at civilizations. This civilization needs water to grow. LA needs to grow. But in the 1880s, there was even a report that said, LA can only grow so big because that's all the water they had. But they looked at Owens Valley in the 1890s. That's when Mulholland went up there. And they decided, we could take the water from that river and bring it down here. That's when they decided to do it. And so they came in and underhandedly bought off a bunch of people, bought their ranches, saying, they even sent couples into the area saying, oh, we're going to create this little valley. We're going to have this family. I'm going to raise my family. But they all work for DWP. And I, when I joined the Owens Valley Committee, I ran into people that they were like some of the first pioneers that came into the area. And they were really proud that their lands had never been sold off to DWP. Stan Matlake, a guy that was an adversary, started liking me because he had made the place like his homeland. He was going to fight for the valley. So I became friends with him. And I never would have him. But he was saving my homeland. He treated it like his homeland. So all I could do is say, OK, this guy's my friend because we have the same enemy. You know how that goes. But when I got involved with Owens Valley Committee, and I was looking for about 10 years somebody because nobody wanted to listen to this Indian guy. I didn't have a degree. I wasn't a doctor. I wasn't a lawyer. But I always known if I was a white guy, they would want to listen to me. 
But there was a point to where I had asked some other scholars in the area, and they would say, well, we have to write a grant. We have to do this, we have to do that. And then Pat came in. Well, I came over here to repatriate some bones that are in the uh, possession of the, the, the college here, and that changed my world. I got to go in and smudge off these bones, and it's like meeting my ancestors. I walked in there, and there was like eight or nine skulls looking at me. Boom. You open this closet, and there they are. They're looking at me. I'm like, whoa. So I smudged them off, sang them a song. But since that day, my life has changed. That's when Pat had heard about uh, the archaeologist I was working with, Matt Nelson. And she called him, and he, he gave her my name. And next thing you know, I was invited over here. And I looked at it as water politics, and that's what I was involved with. And the University of Berkeley, a world-renowned educational, one of the best colleges in the world for teaching, was interested. I said, what a perfect place to go. What a perfect partnership we could, we could uh, get. And then it started happening. Pat had Jenna. Jenna was interested in water in Indonesia, other Indi uh, indigenous people. That civilization just sweeps to the side. Colonialism comes in and says the first laws of colonialism is you destroy the indigenous people because they have what I want. We treat land and water as a resource, not like the most precious gift that any society ever given is Mother Earth. We stand on it every day. It feeds us. It gives us air because it's evolved to do that. And that's what most of our uh, native uh, religions are about. Take care of Mother Earth or Mother Earth won't take care of you. And that is what's being shown today. Over 15 years, I've been in other documentaries, and one of them was about the ancient Bristocone pines that are above uh, where I live in the White Mountains. And they show droughts of 5, 8, 15, 20, 40, 80, 50, 200 year drought, too. And those are just straight facts. But the people that don't care about facts are the capitalists. They just want to, oh, let's make money. I want to be a millionaire. And how many millionaires can you get? And the worst problem about that is you need customers. You just can't all be millionaires. You've got to have workers. Well, that's what, how I look at LA. This big monster got so big, it needs all these stuff. But when I got involved at the, it was the only way to fight. And then comes Jenna. This lady opened doors. She started it, she started it, she opened them. And then there's Tres, Teresa. She had all the information. She had Von Smith's uh, journals and all these stuff. Chris and, and Chris and Jenna's man over back here, he's, <laughs> sorry. But they studied, they read every one of them. Because I've held uh, Von Smith's journals in my hands, and I couldn't read his writing. Chris could. <laughs> and he, he started telling me these stories, and I'd also read a bunch of legends and stuff, and I, so everything started adding up. Being a native, when I'm reading legends, it's like, okay, I know those places. I, 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 I looked at it a different way than a, most academics would. I just looked at it as a guy who grew up in the area. So this all started happening. And then Jenna moved over on my, on my, on my reservation land, has, still has her trays over there, and she considered it as her home, too, because for three years, we studied. We studied, we walked. We did all these other things. She opened doors that I could never open because of her beauty and her intelligence and being a Berkeley scholar. People just said, oh, we finally have somebody. And they were so interested or even the local people were, had never heard of all these stuff. They had grown up there all their lives. They never knew about these ancient irrigation ditches. But we started finding them. And then after we uh, got all the uh, Von Smith's stuff, Chris and Jenna, they overlaid them on new maps. So we found every one of these places. We went out and GPSed them. And there were some of Von Smith's stuff that were hidden. And we could never find them. And then this BLM guys, they just, Opened the doors for us one day. 
That's what a beautiful woman can do for you. <laughs> and they found stuff that were hidden. So we ended up going out and getting this information and, find, and GPS, and with me and Chris did this, all these other stuff that were hidden because what the, one of the things the federal government did was separated all the evidence. So if you wanted to find it, this evidence, it was separated. You had to go to all these different places. And the best stuff was right there in Bishop. And we, we got it. They gave it to us. We went and uh, GPSed it, put it on a map, overlaid it. We did everything we needed to do. And Teresa, she opened up doors that information from the Bancroft that I had never even thought about learning, but her knowledge of her, what she protects, was there. She opened it. Other members of Pat's class, they jumped on this project. Uh, Caroline, she's like a librarian too. She loved it. She found these journals that from the eight, 1930s that, uh, that Haas came in and he hired four young uh, Indian people that could read and write English and speak fluent uh, uh, Paiute. He sent them out and talked to their elders. That's some of the stuff that Pat and, and Teresa found, all these journals, the stories that nobody would ever have heard of. So we, we got, it blossomed, it got bigger. And then Jenna, she ended up going and started to make a, a documentary and right now, you're going to, we're going to see a trailer on it. But it's blossomed because of the collaboration that these ladies, I call them my team, they brought to me and brought to this hidden history that it's not over. The story isn't over yet because of the documentary. It today will help us fight for our water rights of our people, because right now we are being forced by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to try to accept a water agreement to where they just want to only think about our traded lands. Because in 1937, DWP had so much power, they come in and they actually wanted to move us out of the area, but the, and the federal government almost wanted to do it, just said, we're going to move you guys, because LA is so powerful and they had the political clout. Well, we are still fighting but they're trying to force us into it. And I keep telling them about the report Chris and Jenna did, a, a legal report. And my, my people, because we trade off uh, council members every two years, which is a bad thing because it's just bad. But this is our fight. Jenna's documented it. We're going to watch part of it. And I'm just proud and happy to be associated with these very, very great human beings. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Jenna. Hi, so I'm not going to talk for, for oh, woo. Wow. Oh, you're going next. Sorry. I'm going next, uh, but I'm going to actually keep it short and sweet. So I think my role is to tell you a, a little bit about archives. Um, and not necessarily specifically about the Bancroft, but again, you know, it's, this project obviously shows how rich you can, uh, the, the materials are and how you might use them. But I want to also just encourage everybody to go into archives. So I'm going to talk specifically about the Bancroft's collection, but, but very quickly, because I do want to go on to, to Jenna's section. Um, so the Western and uh, Latin Americana collections uh, at the Bancroft Library were originally gathered by Hubert Howe Bancroft in the 19th century. So interestingly, he was interested in Native American history. And in fact, the first five volumes of his works, this is his 37 volume uh, History of California, the West, Mexico, and Central America, was called Native Races. So he collected documents that included descriptions from the colonial period to the end of the 19th century about uh, the various Native American groups and their encounters, often violent, with missionaries, settlers, traders, and artists. But notable about, uh, among these 19th century materials that Hubert Howe Bancroft collected were uh, materials gathered by a, a French scholar and linguist named Alphonse Pinart, who had 
early on this very keen interest in ethnological interest, and he was actually an incredible linguist and uh, captured a lot of uh, California native languages. So in the 20th century, um, this important primary material collected by anthropologists co uh, continues Pinard's works. And these collections provide evidence of the rich cultures of California's native peoples. Included are field notebooks and other scholarly material uh, collected by people like Alfred uh, Krober, his students Robert Lowy and Robert Heiser, and members of the anthropology department here at Berkeley. Another outstanding component of this collection is, are the materials collected by C. Hart Miriam, who was a naturalist who later in his career became interested in California's native peoples. So in addition, to bang, uh, the, uh, in addition Bancroft holds uh, manuscript collections and printed documents of the, the, the Plains, the Far West, Alaska, Mexico, and Central America, and the Pacific Islands. And during the 20th century, we have collected documentation related to the, the urban Indian experience, including uh, a, a group of materials called the American History Community History Project, which documents the activities of intertribal uh, friendship house in Oakland. And we also have photographic archives that document the contemporary uh, California Indian experience. So we continue to build on these collections. So our collections are not frozen. They're actually growing collections. Um, we in libraries and archival repositories, I think, are charged with preserving and making accessible these rich materials in our special collections. So while we do function as gatekeepers, our policy is very open. Our caretaking role is intended to preserve these documents for future generations, as well as for uh, allowing people you know, in, in our contemporary uh, uh, situation to look at the materials. But we are also a public repository, and thus we are not only open to uh, University of California Berkeley students and faculty and staff, but to a broad community of local, national, and international users. Our commitment is, is made uh, uh, is to make these materials accessible to researchers to the best of our abilities. So another project I want to mention uh, briefly that relates to uh, Native Americans is the campus project called Breath of Life. So this is a biennial uh, uh, workshop that's sponsored by the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival and the University of California, Berkeley. So it, it allows uh, uh, California Indians who, who may have not have uh, sort of weak or, or uh, uh, don't have fluent language speakers to come onto the campus and work with people in the linguistics department, the Hearst Museum, and the Bancroft to uh, explore uh, the rich documentation that relates to, to their cultures. So the goal is for them to so have access to this material, to pick a project um, based, uh, so it's a, a language pod pro project based on these materials, and then at the end they present it to the group of people uh, um, in a public forum. And each uh, language group is assigned a, a linguist or um, either a graduate student or faculty member who can help them with this project. So this is, again, an example of, uh, of I think, a, a very successful project that's been going on for many years. So when Pat approached me about using the Bancroft's resources for this community service project, which is this American Culture uh, project is uh, focused on, I was very happy to do so. So for her class, we pulled a variety of materials to demonstrate water use in the Owens Valley and how that related to the history and culture of the Paiute people. So we looked at maps, photographs, and manuscripts uh, and, and that included uh, diaries and field work. Some of this relates to uh, Jenna's and Harry's projects. So I'm going to let the, the, the film and Jenna actually speak of, to some of that, um, as especially the von Schmidt, which I think is incredible what they did with those materials. But I want to focus on two groups of material that they used, uh, simply because they're so extensive. And I, I'm sure there are other people who might want to use them for d different regions of California. So the first is C. Hart Miriam's photograph collection. So Miriam was a naturalist, and he studied uh, extensively the flora and fauna of California. But later in life, uh, funded by the, the Harriman family, Merriman focused, uh, uh, his focus shifted to uh, studying Native American tribes in, in the Western United States. 
So his contributions included documenting the myths of Central California, but also an extensive documentary, uh, pho photographic documentary project where he uh, went all through California uh, photographing indigenous people from California. So these photographs served as one of the deep and rich resources that was used in the class. The second collection, and actually well, both Pat and uh, Harry have talked about this, is called Ethnological Documents. Um, so one of the class projects, actually uh, students are assigned to look directly at these notebooks that uh, people have been talking about, and they work collaboratively to describe them and interpret them in a class project that's then shared. Uh, so again, this is uh, uh, using primary resources in a very sort of immediate and rich way. So these archives, ethnological documents, I want to describe a little bit about what they include. So they can be field notes, linguistic grammars, correspondence, drawings and photographs, genealogical tables, charts and maps and drawings. So you can see there's a rich uh, sort of um, uh, well of material that people can use for historical research. So the particular group that these students were looking at um, related to the Bishop Paiute and also other Paiute uh, uh, area, groups in that area were gathered by Dr. Frederick Hulse and Dr. Frack, uh, Frank Asim. So what they did was particularly unique and interesting, which I think um, Harry and uh, Pat has alluded to. They actually had, instead of doing typical field work where the anthropologist questions their informants and takes those, uh, uh, that information down, what they had is they had younger people working with their elders. So these narratives that they collected were various. So biological, uh, sorry, biographical sketches on some of the uh, people, the elders that they, the younger people were working with, myths, and culturally related material uh, that document the life of the people. So for instance, uh, recording information on indigenous foods, how they were gathered, cultivated, processed, or related to artifacts such as creating ba uh, baskets and making tools. So uh, there would have been a connection between the storyteller and the young person taking down the narrative, passing on these life stories, these traditions and cultures. So that is what, what Harry is doing, I think. What he's expressed so clearly is that these documents are so important to the Paiute people. And I think part of what he is trying to do is take these stories that were told uh, by his people to his people uh, so this generational transfer and continue that into the present. So the Bancroft continues to be interested in projects that serve a diverse community, uh, the, the very diverse communities in California. And this project is particularly attractive because there are such rich, rich resources. And they're used not only by, again, us uh, on this campus, the Cal students, but potentially by the, the Paiute community in California, uh, in California. So we worked with, with them to introduce them to the resources. And I must tell you, Harry's insights is inval invaluable to the students. I think you know the students you have here can talk about some of the presentations he's uh, been part of and his uh, sort of collaboration with them and looking at these documents. <laughs> So what we are hoping, uh, and, and maybe we can talk about this during the discussion, is uh, Pat and other uh, uh, tribal members want to do a future project, which will bring young Paiute students up to work with her students uh, um, and, and see what comes of that. So um, the other thing I want to mention is we love these projects, um, which are can impact people um, individually, but I also that they, they these projects can have a very large life. And I'm, I'm sort of going to pass this on to Jenna, because Jenna has realized um, this incredible, uh, uh, using these resources, many lives can, can be found in this project. She did a wonderful exhibition at the Bancroft Library, uh, which uh, was, I think she, some of that gets incorporated into the film. She also did a website. So we like working with people to sort of disseminate this information and get it out there to a broader audience. Um, so um, uh, I just want to you know, turn this over to her because I think she has uh, so many wonderful details that she can tell you about how she used these documents and how she collaborated with Harry and the other Paiute people to bring this story to life. So thank you.
So, <clears throat> wow, that's loud. And I already talked about it. Okay, so um, I was in my junior year here at Berkeley, and I had just finished up doing research on the Chitarum River in West Java, Indonesia. It's the most polluted river in the world. There's an indigenous peri-urban group of villagers of about 20,000 that live there that are being poisoned by their water. And um, you know, it was an incredible experience. But I think, you know, I, I think that I sort of thought that it would be exotic to go to some other place and do research and sort of try to save the world out there. And I think, you know, more than anything out of that experience, I learned that I wasn't really paying attention to my own backyard, so to speak. And I was really excited, unlike a lot of students here, that we're required to take an American cultures class. I thought, hmm, this is the perfect opportunity for me to really dig into my own backyard. I was very, very passionate about water itch issues and specifically how water and indigenous communities intersect. And so when I went onto the class schedule and I actually, sorry, let me back up, Jane came to me because Jane had been a mentor of mine in the Miller Scholars Program my first year at Berkeley. And she had sent me an email and she's like, there's this great new AC class that's starting. It's called Researching Water in the West. It's in the writing program. I know you love writing. I had a journalism background. And I was like, this is great. This is perfect. Researching Water in the West. So I can continue my love for water and indigenous communities and I can focus on California. And so, you know, I went into Pat's class, very, very excited. We started, you know, doing a pretty extensive literature review on water in the West. And I was reading Mark Reisner, God rest his soul's book, Cadillac Desert. And, you know, he's a great journalist. He's very sensational, not really loved by the academic community very much. But what sh struck me is that there was only one, there was maybe five words in there about the Paiute, but it was just enough words to pique my interest. I said, wait, there's an indigenous community there that was practicing water techniques, and, and I've never heard of this before. So I started digging everywhere I could to see there, where there was more information. And I came across a book called um, Western Times and Water Wars, written by John Walton, and he dedicated an entire chapter to the Paiute and their irrigation practices and their history and sort of how they were being negatively impacted by LA's presence in the valley. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a group of people who are really being excluded from the dominant LA Owens Valley water narrative. And I think maybe there's a gap here that I can fill or attempt to fill or sort of sink my teeth into. And so I went in, you know, like a good student does, I go into John Walton's bibliography and I start looking at his citations. And I start looking up his sources and I start having a hard time locating his sources. His citations weren't as detailed as they sort of needed to be for me to get to the information that I was looking for. And that bothered me. So I found John Walton online and I emailed him. <laughs> And I said, I'm a student at UC Berkeley, and here's what I'm looking at, and I can't find what I'm looking for, and your citations aren't clear enough. And he sent me back an email, and he's a professor at, at UC Davis. And he's like, you're absolutely right, I'm very sorry, Those, I should have been more detailed with my citations, and you know, why don't you come and meet my wife and I down in um, Monterey, and we'll have lunch, and we'll talk about it. And so I sort of went down there, and I started a relationship with him, and I sort of started looking for all of the research that informed that chapter. And it was a very difficult journey because what I found is that most researchers from the time period when he wrote his book were not citing in the way that we were are citing now. And it was really hard to find the stuff I was looking for. And I mean, it took me, Pat and I, you know, we worked hard to try to find it and I, I spent like a good month of the class before I finally realized that they were under my nose the whole time. They were here at the Bancroft. The journals that 
had the irrigation networks mapped in them were actually here in the Bancroft. So I rush over, I, you know, I pull them out there you know, from the mid 19th century. I find all of these. I tell Pat, oh my god, I found these. And she said, in the time that I had sort of found them, she had found Harry, and it was sort of this like magical thing that happened. And he came into class. And I don't even think she knew yet at that point, because he was here for repatriation issues. She didn't know necessarily about his involvement with the irrigation system. So when he came into the class and spoke, he started speaking about the irrigation ditches. And I, I was like, wait a second, they're still there? They're, like you walk them, you know where they are? And he's like, oh yeah, I walk them all the time. I've been walking them my whole life. You wanna come see them? I'm like, yeah, I wanna come see them. And so I, I, my dad flies out from Florida and my boyfriend and we're like, I decide I wanna make this project and apply to the Stronach and sort of uncover these remnant systems that are in the landscape in an attempt to protect them, recover them in American memory, like why aren't these part of the conversation? And so we went down there and we walked these ditches with Harry and it was absolutely life-changing. And that moment continues to reverberate into my life, into, into the, the work that I do, into the lives that the project has touched. Uh, I ended up creating a project that won the Judith Stronach Prize, which was $25,000, which is an incredible amount of money, more money than I had ever even known what to do with, and allowed me to, to go live on Harry's Reservation for a year. And there were three you know, big legs of my project. Um, one was education and outreach, one was mapping the irrigation systems, using those archival documents to sort of you know, connect them to one another. Something I had no idea how to do. Like, I don't have a GIS map, I'm like a Luddite. I, I don't know how to do this. So there was, I didn't know how I was gonna pull that off. Um, and then I wanted to create an exhibit. I wanted these, these uh, archival documents to sort of, you know, be presented and for people to come sort of enjoy them um, and possibly create more research. And so, you know, I had big ambitions, right, with this $25,000. So we, we get down there and, you know, Harry's really sweet. He, he told you guys that the community was really inviting to me. <laughs> That's really sweet. Didn't really work out that way. A white woman from UC Berkeley coming into a native community who's not native and has never had any experience in, an, in a Native American community, um, I was not received very well at first. Um, there were, there were I, I got emails, I know where you live. I mean, it was rough for a few months. Um, but you know, Harry's a, a tough guy, <laughs> right? And so I, it was pretty, pretty quick people started to realize that I was affiliated with him and they didn't really mess with him because people are kind of scared of him there. <laughs> um, he and I would hold forums at the, uh, the cultural center there every week for nine months. The first one I held, maybe Harry showed up. And then the next week, maybe two people showed up, and then more and more, and you know, the crowds got bigger, but mostly they were there to sort of roast me so that happened for a while. Um, and then we just, you know, I said, I, I was really stuck. Like I didn't really know how to, to sort of engage with, with the people. And so I started bringing in, the, it was actually Pat who had the idea. She's like, why don't you bring the stuff in and sort of go through it with them and read it with them and look at the maps with them. And so with her suggestion, I started bringing the documents in and everything sort of started to shift from there. And we sort of had conversations around the materials. And you know, after about a year, I think, there are still people who are difficult, but we move forward anyway. We don't worry about them. Um, and the exhibit happened, which was incredible and ran for an entire semester, I think, almost six months and maybe. And overlapped with one of the, a repeat of the class. And, now, and then we brought the exhibit down to the cultural center, the very place where <laughs> I only had Harry show up that first day. Um, so, you know, a lot of progress has happened. And it really speaks to the ACES program, the American Cultures Engaged Scholarship Program, because that level of sustained community partnership 
between an academic institution and the communities that our research serves is so critical. It's so critical for so many reasons. For healing, it's important. Um, it's important for the students. It's important for the cultures that we serve. So all of that you know, sort of was made possible through the ACES program, through the Stronach, creating sort of that framework and that support system to make this project happen. Um, you know, we went on to map the systems. That took more money and more expertise than I was prepared for. So I, my project money was running out, and I wasn't finished yet. So I had the idea to start a Kickstarter campaign, which is crowdsource funding. I'm sure you guys are pretty aware of that by now. But um, I thought, I, I need to raise another $15,000 to make this happen. I had the Big Pine Paiute Tribe. I wrote a grant with them for the BIA. They ended up giving me like another 10,000 down the line to help with the mapping. But the mapping, I, the mapping needed to happen. I knew that it needed to happen because they lost their water rights in the 1930s. And I felt like first user water rights were a possibility for them if we could prove that they were there irrigating the water first and that those systems were still in place and could still be used if we could sort of create some sort of mathematical modeling system to show what the flow was and how much water was coming through those systems so that we could actually quantify, like if we actually did go to court, what, what would we be asking for? We need sort of a number. And so that's when I brought my partner, Chris, who's a PhD candidate at USC Viterbi School of Engineering, and he came in and he did some water modeling with that grant money and finished all of the mapping for me. And we raised $15,000 through the Kickstarter campaign, which brings me to my final point, and then I'll show you guys the film. I decided, oh, well, I need like a video, right? I should have like a video in the Kickstarter campaign. So I went into iMovie on my computer and I said, oh, there's like a movie trailer thing in here. This is fun. So Chris and I got a little camcorder and we went around and we just started taking videos of the landscape and Harry and this and that and plugging it in, you know. Oh, drop this here for an action sequence and drop this here for, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, it was really, really <laughs> novice. And we went live with the campaign and immediately it started doing really well. It's like $1,000 and then $2,000 and $3,000. And then Harry comes pounding on my trailer on like day four of the campaign. Jenna, Jenna, Jenna. Newspaper in his hand. Jenna, 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 Jenna. I'm like, what's going on, Harry? You're in the front page of the paper. I'm like, what do you mean? It says, and it says on the front page, filmmaker Jenna Cavell to bring story of Paya to the masses. I'm like, wait, filmmaker? <laughs> Wait a second. The trailer ended up being so good and so powerful and the story was so fascinating that it was misinterpreted that I was making a documentary film. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, when the universe calls you to be, you step into those shoes and you just march on. And I'm like, okay, I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> Guess I'm a filmmaker. Um, and that's sort of how I ended up at USC Film School. Um, and how I started to make a documentary. I mean, I said, okay, we're gonna make this documentary. I started doing it, and I realized I had no idea what I was doing, sort of like what happened with the mapping. I had this big idea, and I don't know how to do it, but then I just figure it out as I go along. And um, I just, I realized it was is bigger than I really had the skill set to pull off, and so I decided to apply to film school. And I got in, and I'm finishing my second year of film school now. And uh, what started out as this tiny little iMovie trailer has turned into this pretty incredible piece of film, I think. Um, and I, you know, my objective this whole time has been, they sort of ask you in film school, okay, so what is the main tension of your film? What is the big question that you're sort of asking that's kind of driving um, the story? It's like your lead in journalism. And I said, you know, I want it to, be, to answer the question, or ask the question, will the Paiute recover their water rights? Will they do what they need to do to recover their water rights? Because it's not just as simple, as you know when you work in a community, as proving that the irrigation systems are there, proving how much water went through it, showing the archives, pulling out the legal documents. It actually recreates, it requires a significant amount of solidarity between the three tribes that the government split up over the valley. Those tribes are not unified. And you know, conquering and dividing is sort of you know, the MO of colonialism. And until the tribes come together, they, they won't get their water rights back, no matter how much research I do. 
And so it's not just as, as simple as doing the research. You really have to do that community uh, component to it. And so I'm hoping that the film, my goal of the film is to mobilize the Paiute community to come together and fight for their water rights. And so you can tell me, after you see this trailer, if you sort of have feelings around that. <laughs> Hundred fifty years ago, my people were forcefully taken from this land. There was a massacre that took place here. We understand that the issue is the land, the issue is the earth. Tens of thousands of years, there's evidence of humanity being here. Miles and miles of ancient irrigation systems were dug. That's what they did. And we found them today. Legally today, that might be binding in court. Big dream for LA was to steal the water out of here. They actually stole it. They lied, cheated, and stole. secret entering into the valley. It devastated our culture. Without problems we should note, including poor air quality in the Owens Valley as the Owens Lake dried up, creating dust clouds. We've had a hard time adjusting. We were considered wards of the state. We became reliant on others because that was the system they wanted to see happen. Drought does accentuate conflicts between the urban and rural parts of the state. I stand here in 2013, and the water rights issue has not been resolved. And it's affecting the reservation. It's affecting the water table. It's affecting the vegetation on the reservation. It's going to be a matter of the courts. You need to stand up for your rights. I'd go straight after the president. Where are you at? What does it mean to recover the water rights? Is there legislation going on, or is it? Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs right now, when they traded and created the, our reservations in 1939, they never took into account the ancient irrigation districts. But in the last chapter of our agreement, our land exchange, it says we have other issues to uh, decide and discuss at a later date because it was written in LA's favor. It was just written in all their favor. So right now, we're, we have never quantified or uh, to have a settlement of our water rights, but right now, I think Obama ordered the Bureau of Indian Affairs to settle all these Indian water rights. But they're, trying, they're, not, they're just not even thinking about these ancient irrigation ditches. And they've also added two other tribes in there to kind of like defy and conquer us. So we're being pressured right now, and that's why I was really happy that Jenna, when she did this film, our tribal councils and other members really want to see it because they need to be told because they never learned about these water rights. 
So it, it's really helpful that this is going to come out. So when, um, when the land exchange happened, um, when LA came in and essentially moved the Paiute from various parts of the valley onto the reservation system, there was um, a land exchange agreement that was created. And they said, we're going to trade your lands now, but we're going to come back and trade your water at a later date. And when that happens, all three tribes have to come together and agree to the process of settling those rights. Fast forward from 1937 to now, so many things have happened that have prevented the tribes from sort of coming together to settle the rights. My hope is that after the film, and just to be clear, what you just saw is an extended trailer created for this event. It's not the whole film. Um, my hope is that the film will energize these three different tribes to come together and start entering negotiations and trying to get those, those rights back. In addition to that, Let's say that that doesn't happen. I believe that there's a first user's rights case that also could be put on the table, which is why we hit it at the, from the angle of mapping the irrigation system. So as an activist, I sort of wanted to hit it from as many different angles as possible um, from, from the research side, if that helps. And one of the major things is when I first got this idea was the first user's rights. They can be proven, and this documentary proves it. So we've met with the Department of Water Resources. They came through our area uh, to talk about their current groundwater legislation. And I threw it at their lawyers. And I said, it, those, he was your surveyor. You hired him. He documented it. Documented here at the Bancroft. She didn't know what to say to me. Yes, sir. Um, the first question is to identify the 1880 report that limited the growth of Los Angeles. The second one is um, the dates of the C. Hart Merriman photo collection. The third is, are the canal sites being landmarked or as heritage sites? Four, um, is this information being included in California's drought planning currently? And five, when will your film be on PBS? <laughs> well, one of the things about Owens Valley, DWP owns the entire land. Right. They don't want them studied until we started studying them and looking at them and walking them and GPSing them and overlaying them on maps. That had never been done. They won't, they won't even acknowledge it. You were talking about one of the most powerful cities in the world. They still have the colonial attitude. It's, as an old redneck said, we stole it fair and square. Um, so yeah, so to Harry's point, a lot of the irrigate, most of the irrigation systems are on private DWP land. So for the most part, <laughs> Uh, the majority of what I have done has been technically illegal because I don't even have a permit to be there and they won't, they won't give you one. Um, so in terms of making it a cultural heritage site, they'd have to be on board. Um, and I know there were some attempts by um, other archaeologists that have been there to do that and it's, I, I don't, it would be great if that could happen. I just don't see LA agreeing to what would re be required to do that. Then what so was the I think date? The Seahart Miriam photographs probably date from the 30s to 40s, but you can actually check that online. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I think it's from around that time. And then that report of the 1890 report, did you get that from LA for some? some what was what report are you talking about? Or he's talk, that he talked about. Oh, okay. There was an 1880 report that said LA was limited in terms of its growth because of its lack of water, and then oh. Mulholland Holland used that as the pretext. To go oh. Forward. Well, there was the. A planner, I think, for LA. I just read this currently because they were talking about it. Because last year was a hundred year anniversary of the LA Aqueduct. So a lot more information came out. And then I just picked this up lately that somebody wrote it and they just said uh, 
we can't grow without more water because they already knew that the LA River could only supply them with so much water and they put a number of people that it could, it could take care of. Uh, so that was one of their main goals is we need more water and that's when they went to Owens Valley and they said we can take so, it. So the last piece was is anybody trying to get this you know, included in the current planning, drop planning mm. that the state of California is doing with mm. all this new money they just got? To do what? To recover the systems well, to or to fight the, the water rates? To at least include the Native Americans oh. in the discussion. Well, I know Harry just told me yesterday that there's some new conversations between the tribe and the BIA about settling the water rights. Um, no, I don't think there is. I don't know why there would be. It's not advantageous for LA to settle the water rights because right now they're able just to just take the water and then sell it back to them and sell it to LA. So, you know, they're essentially profiting off of a resource that they're not paying for. And the minute we quantify what went through those systems, and sort of bring that on the table with a wa for a water rights case, then you know that's a, a lot of m a money that they would have to. So, you know, I, I don't really have a relationship with Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. <laughs> well, might be so, good to have, have a look at the governor's office. Yeah. <laughs> that that goes on the word of man manifest destiny. <laughs> it's just like, why should we worry about you? We got all these other people. say how this has been a really wonderful presentation and sort of the, the power of of true collaboration. I have uh, sort of some goal questions and you mentioned that you know it's really important that the three Paiute tribes come together for purposes of negotiating an agreement. Do you think that same solidarity is needed for purposes of legal action? That's sort of my first question. Mm -hmm. And um, the, my second question is sort of is, is your goal um, sort of uh, one or two of, of these goals of uh, monetary compensation or an actual return of water that they stop draining the water um, and and where where's your strategy going on that I, I mean I don't I, I, I can only want, I just want the tribe just my goal as a filmmaker and an activist and a researcher is to get them even talking to one another about this I mean when I got down when I got to the valley with the exception of Harry and maybe one or two other people in the tribe, nobody even knew about these irrigation systems or that they were there. So it's really, I mean, there was a severe cultural amnesia that was sweeping across the valley when I got there. And so for me, as an activist and a filmmaker, I wanna come into the community, you know, sort of work with them to uncover this, go through some processes of healing, you know, have leaders like Harry start to, to bring people together and then kind of step back because it's not really appropriate for me. At, I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm sort of still trying to figure it out, but you know, it's, I, I have to be careful, you know, it's not, I'm not a Paiute and sort of going in there and being like, you have to fight for this is not really appropriate, but rather saying, you know, here's your history Let's talk about it. What do you want to do? Kind of thing. And then, you know, make videos with really cool music that says, go fight. Well, in, uh, sort of. in 1939 was the land exchange. And that involved what's called all the Bishop Big Pine and Lone Pine tribes. And we were called the Owens Valley uh, Paiute Shoshone Bands of Indians. And that created the Bishop, the Big Pine, and Lone Pine tribes. The Independence tribe decided to go out on their own and they have their water rights already quantified. The other tribes, we didn't do that. We weren't these big major tribes. We were like family units all over. And, and so when we got together, we're still there. Some of the old activists when the Owens Valley Indian Water Commission, that was their specific goal, was get us more land and more water because we're outgrowing our, our, our bishop tribes only 876 acres. We have 1,900 members. Uh, the Big Pine tribe is like 350, and they're, we're just outgrowing it. And then we were never taught to fight. Just let LA do what they're doing. It was kind of like the scare tactic. When I first started doing this, the people in Lone Pine, because of the, uh, the bombing of the, uh, uh, the aqueduct in the 20s and 30s, they're scared. They even just told me, God, aren't you afraid for your life? I said, Why, what are they, they going to do, make me a martyr? I, I just, I can't, I can't feel that way. But uh, 
a lot of people support this. They really, and right now, because BIA is pushing on us, I had an ex-chairman of our tribe said, when's your documentary coming out? We need to see it. We need to inform our people of what these rights are, because the, right now the Bureau of Indian Affairs is really putting pressure on us. They're, all, they're acting like, oh, this just informal agreement we did in 1998 is the actual agreement. It was just, it was proposed by them. It wasn't proposed by us. And right now they're saying, there's no, no land going to be exchanged with, for water like that. That's where my idea when we did this, the water rights, the first user's rights, it's legally binding. And uh, when we met with Department of Water Resources, I talked to their, one of their lawyers. And last time, she's here, lives in town, I had dinner with her, we just talked about it. And I threw hard questions at her. I, one of the main ones was, well, uh, Von Smith, he was an employee of State of California. He wrote a report. It's your guys' report that will go against your laws. And are you going to say his report was no good? She just kind of looked at me like, what? Well, it'll take 20 years to be in court. My attitude is, I don't care. But the only power we have, because when LA moved in there, was the water. For us to grow or do anything is to use the resource they are after. So if we can go after their water rights, well, it's our water rights, because they don't want to deal with this. In 1998, I was on our tribal council, and there was a, a long-term water agreement that was settled in 1992 after 30 years of legal challenges. And there was three entities that were proposed to be on this standing committee. It was the tribes, Inyo County, and LA. LA turned around and told the tribes, and, well, if you don't become a part of the standing committee, uh, we'll talk to you a couple times about your land and water rights. Well, I didn't know that. I wasn't part of that on the board yet. Well, in 1998, I met with the LA City Council, and we were talking to him, and Art Waltz, he was the LA City Attorney. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the meeting, he goes, well, we fulfilled our obligation. Uh, we met with you a couple times. And he got up and walked out. I looked at Sandra, one of the ladies that was part of the Water Commission for the inception. She goes, oh, I said, what did he mean by it? She goes, the reason we didn't get on the standing committee is because they wanted to talk, talk to us a couple times. And he, said, he exactly said those words. We talked to you a couple times. We fulfilled the obligation. Got up and walked out. I sat there. I looked at you guys and went, what did you guys are, why did you accept that? We were on that standing committee. We could have fought for the valley, the environment and stuff. But that's the deviousness we put up with. And right now, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is saying, push us. They don't want to talk about water rights or land acquisition. They're just saying, no, no, you guys did this. And they once brought in a Benton tribe that was established in 1975 and tried to force us to let them be a member of the Owens uh, Valley Pirates and Shorty. But they would, if we made an agreement, they would get one fifth and they weren't even part of their agreement. But the, they wouldn't accept the Solicitor General's report. They wouldn't send it to him. Then finally, in the, uh, around the 2000s, the Solicitor General just said, they legally don't have no rights. But right now, they're, the Bureau is saying, no, it's the five tribes, Bishop, Big Pine, Independence, and, and Benton tribe. If you guys don't come together, well, we can't make an agreement. It's like they weren't part of it. But they're trying to force us to do that. And they're, how do you fight that? But with this movie, hopefully we can, uh, or this documentary. So I was thinking that in addition to using the movie to try to unite the tribes, it's really important to use the movie and other things to change public opinion in Los yeah. Angeles, yeah. because right. even you know that can that's what 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 can affect the, the department. That's what can affect the DWR, is the fact that the. The people of Los Angeles, at least significant numbers of them, are changing their attitudes about some of these things. And I think that is a real possibility. And yeah, maybe yeah. You could Actually, talk to that. Harry and I um, are working together to create. We were. I was just hired to direct a sister documentary 
Um, so Paya, the film you just saw, is coming in at around 23 minutes. And I was just hired to direct from the Owens Valley Committee, the committee that he's been speaking about a lot and that we researched in Pat's class extensively. Um, they just hired me to direct a second documentary called Slake, Water and Power in the Eastern Sierra. Um, and that is very geared toward Los Angeles residents and sort of broadening the scope beyond the Paiute experience of this whole debacle and starting to include the other residents of the Owens Valley and looking at the environmental impacts and contextualizing it in, you know, in the, with the current drought and sort of looking at snowpack and climate change and kind of making it a larger issue that pretty much anyone can hang their hat on, not just the Paiute, so that we can create sort of that larger grassroots movement that you're getting at. So yeah. And also, just to piggyback on that, I can't tell you how many students I've had from Los Angeles who said, I had no idea where my water came from. Yeah. It's that invisibility. Mm -hmm. And you know, Harry once made a remark in one of my classes that I, it's really true. When you think of what Los Angeles is, there's no more powerful cultural engine on the planet. The whole world, Los Angeles music that comes out of LA, movies that come out, it, it, you know, it dominates the planet. It would not exist if it weren't for the Owens Valley. To make that visible, that history visible, it's a larger aspect about what's visible in American history and what isn't. But there's an absolute intimate connection between those two. And right now in popular imagination, it, it's not there. Um, the Los Angeles River water resources would support a, a city of about 350,000 people. Mm -hmm. And that's why they said, you know, we're going to grow. By 1905, they're already, we gotta, we're going to grow so much bigger than that. So it's the difference between a city of 350,000 or a city of 4 million. And, uh, okay, and I think right behind you. A um, couple of things. I think just like, uh, just to show how important um, like LA was even back in the 1880s and 90s, William Mulholland was the highest paid state official um, during that time. Yeah, and he was on the, the water board, which is crazy. Um, my other question is, um, is there any way that the Paiute tribe can invoke environmental rights or law or activism to also combat um, LA taking water? Because that w worked for Mono Lake. So I'm wondering if the same thing could be used, the tribe. Well, one of the worst decisions we made was not to be part of that standing committee because of the promise of us getting more land and water. Because right now you have two entities, Inyo County and uh, LA. They have to go to court just to decide how to go to court. <laughs> and we're, we're a county of 18,000 people. We can't afford it. They have 40 uh, lawyers, not including the city attorneys. And to them, we won one court case for the Owens Valley Committee because in 1998, Jerry Gavey said at a water meeting, it's easier for us to go to court than to, for us, it's cheaper for us to go to court than give up the water. And just to be clear on the Mono Lake thing, yes, they used environmental issues to, you, to restructure their water rights but not at an indigenous level. It wasn't for a tribe. So this is a little bit different in that regard. A lot of people try to compare, you know, like, oh, why don't you do what Mono Lake did? Um, and Slake, the second documentary, covers a lot of the Mono Lake stuff, and it's absolutely, it's sort of an inspiring model, and what they did is phenomenal. But it is a little bit different because, you know, tribes are, are, are federal, and, you know, so they're, they're governed in a very different kind of way, so. So you used EPA at one point, yeah. right? I mean, yes. so your comment about environmental stuff at one point. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And the Owens Lake uh, thing, the county kind of didn't have the money to fight LA. They had the biggest PM10, 300 times more than the national average around there. 350,000 uh, metric tons of dust was being blown off the lake annually. And you couldn't see mountains, and they're only 10. And uh, well, the EPA, Felicia Marcus, she just straight off gave us what you could do. She goes, well, sue us. Sue us, sue the EPA, because uh, force us to enforce our own rules. So the Lone Pine Tribe sued them. 
they threaten California, if you don't fix that Owens Lake, we will take away your highway dollars. Instantly, California ordered them to fix it. That's, we've learned basically only the courts LA will listen to. And they try to get around that all the time. We, being on the Owens Valley Committee, it's, it's a struggle. It's a continuous struggle. And I think Thank we have, you. We have time, I think, for one more question. Yes. Just one more thing. On that environmental thing, Harry had a great idea not long ago. Um, the pupfish is an endangered species in the Owens Valley, and they exist on a little creek on the northeast side of the valley um, where they're you know, protecting them. And if we could get some of those pupfish to just appear, <laughs> in one of the ancient irrigation systems that was running, <laughs> then maybe we would be able to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sir, right? You remember so, that idea? <laughs> this, is, this is an eye-opening and absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a question going back to your original uh, interest in Indonesia. Are there lessons to be learned from the experience of the water culture in Bali that y you have brought uh, to this situation in terms of the history of how that was destroyed and then, and then re-understood and so forth? It's a very interesting question. Well, first of all, it wasn't in Bali, it was in Java. I've never even been to Bali, but um, that's interesting. You know, the big problem in Indonesia is the textile industry. So they just, they have laws in place that say industry can't dump poisonous waste into the water, but they do it anyway because Indonesia is incredibly corrupt and you can pay off anybody there. Um, you know, so in ter terms of like the lessons that can be learned, I'd say that it's, there's a lot of similarities. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. I should think about it more. Um, <laughs> beyond for me, the lessons learned for me are that it's incredibly important to live with the culture and have a sustained relationship with the culture that you're researching and that you're serving, as opposed to you know, going in for a couple of months and then leaving. I mean, I think the, the, the result of the project that it, here is that I've been in that valley for three years, and before I even got there, I did a full year of primary source research in the library here, and you know, have, working, building nested relationships in the community and with Indonesia, and this is a big mistake that I think a lot of undergraduate researchers make, unfortunately, and I know that this institution is very gung-ho about undergrad research, is that we were very ambitious and sort of excited about the possibility of doing research, but often we're going into communities, like in Indonesia, for example, the primary source, I couldn't do primary sources research there. Why? I spoke Bahasa Indonesia because I learned it here at UC Berkeley, but the Dutch colonized Indonesia, so all of the archives are in Dutch. For me to learn Dutch, we're talking 10 years to be able to study the archives in Dutch. So that was, that's the biggest lesson that I learned, is you know, just, I, I was like, I wanna go study the most polluted river in the world, and that's sort of like what I went in there with, not really fully understanding you know, how sensitive the issue was culturally and the language barriers and how important primary source research was. And it was through the collaboration with Pat and Teresa and the ACES program that I sort of learned the value of that. So that's the biggest lesson for me to learn, I guess. Okay. Ah, do we have oh, a quick one? The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and then the International Tribal Council, um, does that offer hope in repudiate, repudiating the doctrine of discovery, which essentially um, gave legal rights to uh, take over so-called unoccupied lands? Mm -hmm. uh, not that big, but... It was 1824, they said that uh, if you weren't Christian, then you were kind of like less than us and you didn't have rights to own land. So that's what we always for. It's still, it's a Supreme Court decision. So when I hear this thing, well, we're a Christian nation, I look at it, you're an evil 
religion because you made it legal or religious to steal our land because we were less than you. And we had the right to kill you, too, if you tried to fight back. So that's, that's a big question. And I'm not aware of any. The Idle No More movement could potentially serve as an intersection, I think, between the, their tribe and sort of some larger issues that you're touching on. But, um, and we frame it a little bit in the, in the documentary in terms of the Idle No More movement. Um, <coughs> Harry's tapped into that movement a little bit. I, I don't, that would be sort of the only kind of in that I would imagine, the Canadian. But a lot of group. tribes have their own problems. It's like, yeah, I mean, I don't uh, know. are so separated that. and diverse. We've mentioned it to uh, the National Congress of American Indians. We brought it up. They tried to support us, but if the BIA or the Interior Department doesn't want this idea, they'll just dump you. Well, it does relate to sustainable development, and For the sustainable sure. development goals of the United Nations are being decided this year. So this mm. tiny community really offers some hope for setting a precedent. Yeah, that's... And, and on that very help, the hopeful note, um, I think we'll say thank you so much for being with us. <laughs>